for our opening hymn. Please stand and join us as we sing hymn number 183. I will, oh, tell me the story of Jesus. 152, actually. Hymn 152, tell me the story of Jesus. Shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for the wonderful song, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord, that you died on the cross for our sins. Thank you for your mercy and your protection you have given us throughout the week. Bless us today as we keep the Sabbath holy, as we come and worship you in beauty and holiness. Bless our service today. May your holy angels be with us, protect us from any harms and danger. And your Holy Spirit be with us in order for us to understand all the words. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for the forgiveness of all our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You will be seated. Good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you that we have some visitors today. Uh, happy to see the Lamaneros family. Uh, thank you so much also for uh, coming here today. Those, we see Anne and husband, and she'll be doing also our special number. Uh, we have some announcement today.
uh, prayer and fasting today. We don't have bad luck today. But we have prayer and fasting. This is very important for each and every one of us. And uh, it's April. We have to start our small group. Some already started. I haven't started yet. Maybe today. <laughs> um, well, uh, about uh, we're studying about about what happened to Lo Venezuela, our beloved sister. But Pastor will talk about that. I'll give him the time now. So everybody uh, aware of the passing of our sister, Betelu Venezuela. I think Brian, I think the kids left, okay. So I visited their home a few days ago and offered our condolences. And Brian and Pai said, we promise to bring our, our, their kids every Sabbath here to continue the legacy of Mrs. Lou because the kids come uh, Sabbath here. So that's why they're here this morning, early morning, with the little kids for the Sabbath school. So this is sudden because they were just expecting her arrival a few days ago. But she passed away at um, Amsterdam, just right almost going off from the cruise ship for, because of the sudden heart attack. So everybody is grieving right now, all the church, of course, the family for the sudden death of Ms. Venezuela. So we offer our condolences already. And next Sabbath is the plan for tribute in the fellowship hall where we used to go do recital. So I think there is a lot of people will be coming for that time, Sabbath afternoon at four o'clock. And then maybe we can just bring something for uh, chip in some finger foods to help the family, especially on uh, giving some of this uh, support. Four o'clock next Sabbath at Arlington, not the church, one of the uh, fellowship hall. It's, it can accumulate like uh, 300 people there and big space. It's tribute. This is not a memorial service because the memorial service is still on to be finalized. What place? Mm -hmm. Two o'clock on Sunday, and they will bring the urn, okay, the ashes, the time. So we'll we'll prepare the program for next Sabbath, the church for the song service and everything for the next Sabbath afternoon. So that's the plan for Mrs. Venezuela. So I really uh, appreciate your support and prayer for the family. They were really broken because of this sudden death. And also, I uh, would like to announce that our small group started, and we have leaders here. We started last Sabbath in Albans. May I call our leaders? Please stand because they will like to know where our leaders, John Saramosing, Mike, and Bunbon. Uh, these are our leaders for small group. This is really important for our, the life of the church. So we prayed about this that uh, starting April, we start looking for a place that we can meet once a week. We, I started with Alvin and few GD and few three families. We started last Saturday, five o'clock. We have this gathering prayer together. Simple things that will bring us closer, connected to each other. Because this is the continuous uh, life of the church. So you have group already. You have chosen last night. Praise God. And Bon, you have group. I can ask you to help me here in Alvin's group. Okay. Five o'clock. Uh, how about Brother Francesco? That started. Borlison, your Alice is Borlison. So anyone close to Borlison, you can connect to Brother uh, uh, Francesco and uh, Northside. Northside. Yes, get their, they have their numbers here. And Brother Mike, what group uh, 
discover Arlington? Arlington. So this is really different level of relationship with as a group family. We pray together in a small group. It's different. As Al mentioned, this is really good, right? We enjoy JD and a group. We just gather together, sharing and coming together in small group. So I hope find your, just connect with them. They will approach you, connect for a small group. This is really important. It was tried in many places around the world. Small group is really a vital for our spiritual growth. Not just church here in the building, fellowship, really have, we need to connect to a small group. This is really good for our relationship. And we have lessons prepared. So just go on from there. So let's continue to just let you know these are the leaders that we set for us to connect for our group. And Joseph is one in Kin. Joseph is not here, right? So Kin is also one group, those who are living in Kin. Okay, thank you. Please be seated. And here, I would like to also announce our prayer and fasting. Today, after the service, uh, we have a break. And then come to the next part is the prayer and fasting. So many are asking, if, I, if you choose to eat something, you can come back. You're welcome. So it's okay. So if you, you have not prepared for prayer and fasting, you have grabbed some food in your car, just come back right away because this is for everybody. So this is an open for all of us who wants to join in our prayer and fasting service. We will be doing us in the general conference. If you go to the website, prayer and fasting, every first Sabbath of the quarter, is a prayer and fasting service. So we did it since the time until now we are doing prayer and fasting. So it's the focus is preparing for the final days by studying his word. So we enjoy this preliminary. Actually, we have our morning worship every five o'clock. Not everybody can join, I know, but we enjoy those who join the five o'clock prayer. May I see your hands? <laughs> Only a few, it's okay. But we enjoy five o'clock prayer morning prayer five o'clock to five fifteen it's really a beautiful time to hear and share the word of god in prayer in prayer every five o'clock in the morning so this last morning this morning that's our last so next quarter again we plan to make it a regular every first week of the quarter it's really good to wake up at five and read the scripture and pray together it's a good good spiritual uh voice to hear the voice of God in prayer and fasting and also in prayer in the morning. So that's, I would like to encourage you to join. Expect more blessings in our prayer and fasting this morning. Oh, we have one more here. Uh, actually, we, yesterday, I went to Lutheran Beautiful Savior Church where Mrs. Banzuela is doing the piano for almost 30 years. So I called the pastor, I'm here in your church. I want to meet you because this is the day that we plan to meet you in the church. But now she is gone, I'm here. I just initiated myself and said, oh, pastor, I'm sorry, I'm off today. But we will take, we will honor what we have talked with Mrs. Venezuela. Because the, before she left, she said, pastor, when I come back, I would like you and the pastor of Lutheran to meet together in this church, and we will plan for the rental of their church. So that's the, so this Wednesday, I will meet with the board of elders, their pastor, and Ryan and I will meet at their church this Wednesday, because they still believe and they will honor what we have talked to Mrs. Venezuela. Uh, so that's Wednesday. And this 3 o'clock, we have also a church for visit, uh, 1919 South Collins Street at 3 o'clock. There is another prospect here that is open for us to visit at 3 o'clock after our prayer and fasting service this morning. The address? This afternoon. This afternoon, yes, this afternoon. <laughs> after the prayer and fasting. So we'll go straight to the area for the visit of this church, another prospect for our church. I think we cover everybody and Brother John, our elders. Before Brian, Ryan, 
I'll read to you in the book of Psalms 145, verse 8 and 9. It says here, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. May the Lord bless our service today. It's time for our um, intercessory prayer, um, where if you have prayer requests, you can um, write it on the papers behind the pews and drop it in the box here. Um, let's sing, I Must Tell Jesus. Where possible, please kneel. Dear kind Heavenly Father, we come to you just as we are, asking for your mercy so that our petitions will be worthy in your throne of grace. We know that you have promised, Lord, that where two or three gathers, you are in our midst. We praise you, Lord, for this beautiful, windy Sabbath day that we could gather. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of life that you have granted us 
As we look back in the week that has passed, Lord, we praise you because we all have so much to be thankful for despite the trials that come our way. Because we know, Lord, that you would never give us trials that we can endure and that you were always there for us. We know that you are the God who rescued the Israelites from bondage and slavery and that you are the same God who will deliver us from the hardships that come our way. We praise you, Lord, for traveling mercies, daily provisions, our jobs, and the little things that we take for granted. We pray continually, Lord, that we have faith in you, because without faith, it is impossible to please you. We pray for those who are sick, Lord, those who are suffering from ailments physically, mentally and emotionally. May you touch them and heal them, Lord. We pray for those who are suffering from the loss of a loved one, especially the family of Auntie Lou. Words are not enough to comfort them, Lord, but we trust that you will be the only comfort they seek because of the promise of assurance of that great resurrection morning that you will unite us with our loved ones. We pray, Lord, for our children Please protect them from the enemy, because when we look on how the world is today, the enemy is really trying his best to make them of this world. We may have so many burdens, Lord, that we can't mention, but we know that you know all of them. We pray for our church in our quest for getting a property, Lord. We trust in your perfect plan that you will open the doors for us. But just like Jacob, Lord, we want to never let go of your hand until you give us the blessing of finding that building for us and reminding us that the church, it's not just the building, but the church is us, your people. Open our hearts, Lord, for service. Open our eyes that we may see the need of the people around us, especially our neighbors, and make us a blessing to others every day, and that Jesus will be seen in us. Please also bless the speaker, Lord. May that he will enlighten us, and that the words will come from you, and that we may be able to um, seek you more in our everyday lives. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. But your will be done. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is now time for children's story. If the little ones could come up.
Right. Hello, boys and girls. So today I'm going to read you a story about Jesus healing the ten lepers. Who can do a miracle? Only God can. A miracle is something special, such as making a sick person well with only a touch or a word. When Jesus lived on earth, he did many miracles to show people that he is God the Son, the one God had promised to send. One day, Jesus walked by a small village. Suddenly, a group of men called out to him. These men had a terrible disease called leprosy. Leprosy was a sickness that caused a person to get big sores all over his skin. People who had leprosy were called lepers. In Bible times, God made a law that when a person got leprosy, he had to live with other lepers. He could not stay at home because other people in his family might catch the disease of leprosy. The ten men who called Jesus were lepers. They heard of Jesus. The men knew Jesus could heal sick people. They hoped Jesus might heal them too. Jesus, Jesus, help us, they cried. When Jesus saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. And that day, when a person had leprosy and then got well, he had to go see the priest before he could go back home to live with his family. The priest would say whether the leprosy was gone or not. When Jesus told the men to go show themselves to the priest, they ran off to see the priest. Because they believed Jesus, he healed them as they were running to see the priest. As they ran, they looked down and saw that their skin was clear and healthy again. They were well. Jesus had made them well. One of the lepers, seeing that he was well, suddenly stopped. He wanted to go to the priest so that he could be allowed to go back home, but first he turned and ran back to Jesus. The man fell on the ground in front of Jesus and began thanking Jesus for making him well. Jesus said to the man, Weren't there ten more lepers whom I healed? Where are the other nine? Are you the only one who has come back to praise God for making him well? Of course, Jesus knew the answers to these questions. He asked these questions to teach the people who were with him. The lesson was this. When God does something for us, we need to be sure to thank him. We need to tell him how happy we are for what he has done. Does it make you feel good when someone thanks you for what you have done for them? Yes, everyone likes to hear thank you from other people. You can make your parents and brothers and sisters and your pastor and even your teachers happy when you say thank you for the things they do for you. God is pleased when we say thank you to each other and to him. Can you think of something you can thank God for today? Let's thank him right now. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you that you've brought us to church and we could come here and that you sent your son down to heal us from all our sickness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can go back to your seats now. Morning and happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Now is the time where we return to God, that portion that He's allowed us to keep uh, safe for Him in order to build the church more and more. So we bring our tithes back to the house. Um, this time, they, uh, we're concentrating on the local church budget as well for this week. Uh, but also a reminder that we're still uh, building up the funds for getting a new building. However, even if we don't get another building, we are still the church, and we must continue to hold steadfast and wait in silence for God's answer because he's going to let us know where we're going to go and if we're going to go. We know that we're in the last days as well, so we need to stay vigilant and watch continually. Um, I have a letter here I'd like to read uh, by Heather Thompson Day, uh, titled Local Church Budget. 
She writes, years ago, a mentor of mine encouraged me to take my relationship with God as seriously as I take my career. She saw me as a very driven person, but she instructed me to make sure that I connected with God at the beginning of every day. That began my habit of waking up before the sun rises around 5 a.m. to spend quiet time reading God's word and reflecting on it through prayer. A little bit ago, my husband and I noticed our daughter taking out her Bible in the morning before getting ready for school. She found a corner in our living room to pray. When my husband asked her why she was up so early, she said, Mommy gets up early to speak to Jesus, and I want to be like Mommy. Amen. I was so struck by my daughter. It was, it was and is my desire that my daughter develops a deep personal connection with Jesus. I simply wasn't aware of just how much my silent witness of waking up early impressed her. Whether this is your first time at church or your family built this church, if you look around, it's likely you will see someone whose spiritual journey with God you can learn from. Today's offering goes to our lo local church budget. In order to keep our church ministries functioning, we depend on the generosity of members returning that faithful offering to support our local church. We want to remind you that everything that you do, all the portions that you give back are always rewarded manifold. Um, the blessings that you receive, you can continue to see manifested in your life. We could have the deacon stand now. We have a, a special music from you after our... Uh, Offering, we have a special song by Samantha. We can bow our heads. Our Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to return to you that which you've entrusted in us. We ask that you continue to strengthen us, help us to overcome and become great witnesses for you as we continue our work. Uh, help us to keep our eyes focused on you. Help us to be able to wake up in the morning refreshed and blessing you in order to be able to continue throughout the day. We thank you for everything. We ask that you bless this offering. Help it to continue to do your work so that we can go home to see you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Happy Sabbath, church. So I will be singing by myself. We were probably not aware that Bernie, my husband, would be joining to sing with me. So... you, Lord. All your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your arms. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, how oh, I am seen with the goodness of God Cause all my life I am faithful And all my life you have been so so good With every breath that I am able Oh I will sing of the goodness of God, I love your voice. You have helped me through my darkness from the darkest night. You have lived love no waters. I know you as a friend. goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid out, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness it's running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I leave you everything. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, 
so again with every breath that I am able. Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. All my life you've had been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I'm gonna sing for the goodness of God the goodness of God. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Our scripture reading today will be coming from John chapter 4, verse 35. Do you not say... There are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. May God bless the reading of this word. Amen. Before our speaker will share the word of God, I would like to make also this uh, one announcement here. Two days, uh, last Two days ago, we have our workers meeting, the whole Texas conference is to announce that we are celebrating the 145 years of Texas conference. With that, follows with the uh, evangelistic crusade by Pastor Mark Finley coming to Houston for the reaping crusade. And each pastors around Texas will conduct an evangelistic meeting. So Pastor Jonathan Bileu, uh, Grand Prairie, and I will be doing an evangelistic crusade on before Pastor Mark Finley, so we'll announce uh, the location. So we have also a prayer group meeting for, in celebration for the 145 years. And the goal is to bring more souls to the feet of the cross. It's not about the numbers, but it's about how we can be involved in preparing for souls for Jesus. So start praying for this great harvest that God will open the door for all Texas. And April 20 is the Texas-wide conference distributing of the great controversy so this is also very timely because that's why i invited especially our speaker this morning our publishing director of texas conference to share to us especially in line of uh, sharing the gospel how we can witness and be more involved in the final years of earth history so god called us for a special reason we are here for a purpose so we would like to encourage and strengthen our brethren to be prepared for uh, this coming uh, service for community sharing the books, The Great Controversy. I think we have about millions of copies around the world. And in Texas, I think we have two million order for Great Controversy books to be distributed on this month of April 20. Some are distributing on April 8, not April 8, this week. Because of the coming of the, what? Eclipse, right? So there is a book covered converging of light and darkness, but the, well, it's a message also to share to the whole world. But uh, we believe that the time is getting short, more than shorter than we first believed, the coming of Jesus. So our speaker this morning is a publishing director of Texas Conference for 10 years, 20 10 years, right. So he works as our publishing ministry department director, encouraging churches, members, students. I have been a canvassing, uh, doing a literature ministry for the newly Adventist. Canvassing work is one of the lingua of the Adventist where we go actually door to door, sharing the books filled with literature on health, uh, magazines, great controversy books sharing to house to house for six years in my college years i spent same break semester break 
Christmas break, going door to door for the canvassing for six uh, years at Mountain View College in the Philippines. So this is also an opportunity for college students, even uh, young people to join in the canvassing work because this is a second to none work because it's bringing us closer, more in prayer and commitment, dedication to Jesus. So Pastor Joshua Reina, married to uh, wife, his wife is Rin, Rachel Reina, and they have two kids, Matthew and Rebecca. So welcome to our church for the first time, and we are, uh, thank God for sending you to here, to DFW Film Church. Thank That's about prayer. Much. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you send your servant here to share the message. Speak through him and through your word and through the message today that will encourage us, inspire us, to be prepared for your soon coming as we witness in these last days uh, message of the end time. And above all, prepare us for your soon return. Bless us now as we open and receive your word through your servant. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you guys. Like Pastor said, this is the first time for me to visit this church, and so it's a blessing to be here. And um, before we get started, though, I would like to begin with just one more word of prayer. Thank you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we just ask that your spirit would be with us here today as we open your word as you've promised. Ask that you would speak through me and um, that we all can receive a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so um, like the pastor said, my name is Josh. I have a wife and two kids, and I serve as the literature ministries director or the publishing director for the Texas Conference. And so some of the things that we do, um, like he mentioned, the Cole Porter work. How many of you guys ever got an experience to be a Cole Porter? Maybe while you were in, in school or maybe as a full-time Cole Porter? A few of you guys. So we still have a Cole Porter work here in Texas. I know that um, in many places... It has kind of died down a little bit, but here in Texas, we still have a strong Cole Porter work, and there are many avenues for each one of us to get involved. What I wanted to talk to you guys about today, though, and let's see if this is, there we go. Um, I, just, I want to start off with a story. Um, how many of you guys have been to a lighthouse? Seen a lighthouse? I ha I've been to several of them. You know, here in Texas, we don't have a lot of lighthouses. <laughs> I've been to um, the Gulf Coast, and it's very flat, not a lot of rocks, um, not a lot of need for lighthouses. But if you go to the northern United States, specifically the northeastern United States, you'll find a lot of lighthouses. You'll find them around the Great Lakes region and also along the, the seaboard. Back many years ago, lighthouses used to be something that was essential for the travel of ships along either the Great Lakes or the ocean. Um, nowadays, we have, you know, radar and other, other ways for us to see when rocks are coming in. So they're not as, you know, useful or used today. But back in the day, this was the only way for ships to travel safely. So in one of those lighthouses... There was a lighthouse keeper and his two children and his, his wife, and they were living there. And the job of the lighthouse keeper, sometimes they would live on a small island that would be separated from the shore. And so they would be there for days, sometimes weeks on end, without connection to the, sh to the people on the shore because of their need to keep the light going. And so in this particular family... The father, he would, he would go up, you know, every evening, polish those mirrors that would shine the lights out into the, into the ocean, and he would make sure everything was running, and he would, you know, check on that whole system several times a night to make sure that everything was working. And so this particular night, he climbed up those many stairs. If any of you guys have been to a lighthouse and gone up the stairs, you'll know that you have several... Yes, it's a spiral going up, and you, you can get winded depending on how long a journey it is to the top. Some of them are very tall. And he would go several times a night to go up and check. 
Upon returning from one of those visits to check on the light, he found that he started not feeling so well. And he checked his temperature, found that he had a fever, and he, started, he got very sick very quickly. And his wife stayed and, and started taking care of him, and he kept getting worse and worse and worse. And the, his two young children, they noticed that their father was getting worse, and they started thinking about the time, and it's about time to go up and check up on the light, make sure everything's running. And he, 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 there's no way he's going to climb, be able to climb the lighthouse in his current condition. And mom is taking care of him, and so the, the burden falls upon the two children to climb the lighthouse and check and make sure that everything is working. Because this could be life or death for a ship off the shore. And so the two children climb the lighthouse, and as they get to the top, they see the light is burning, but they notice that there's a problem. As they look, many of you may not know, but the light, they have a small light, either powered by gas or even in the old days it would be a flame, you know, flame by, like, by wood, um, but it's powered by gas, and there's a mirror that rotates around, making that light spread through the ocean and through the darkness, and it would look like a flashing light to ships out in the harbor. And they noticed that that mirror was faced inward, and the light was not going out to sea, thus not helping anyone. And so they looked, and, and the mechanism that, was, that usually would automatically turn this mirror to shine the light out was broken wasn't working, and there was nothing that they could do to make it work, and so they realized that they were going to have to hand crank this mirror around. And so the, the crank was a hard, hard piece of equipment to turn, and it would take all of their strength for the two of them to do this on their own. And so the two of them looked at each other and said, you know, what if there's a ship out there? And so they decided to crank. And I can just imagine how tired they began to get as they crank and they crank. But in their mind, it kept going through their mind, what if there's a ship? What if? What if? And so they kept on cranking. I don't know about you, but um, I used to work when I was in college. I had several construction jobs. And I remember having a job where I was dealing with concrete. And I had concrete, and it was in a big wheel. They filled up the wheelbarrow full of concrete, and I would be pushing this wheelbarrow full of concrete to the site where we're pouring the concrete and I remember finishing dumping out the concrete and I couldn't open my hands I had to literally slide my hands off the end of the bars for the concrete because after doing something for so long your hands get stiff and I'd have to sit there and work with them slowly and I can just imagine these two young children sitting there with their hands frozen on this crank as they keep cranking and cranking and cranking until the morning dawns. And the two of them, I, I can only imagine, had to remove their hand. They couldn't open their hands at the end of it. Why am I telling this story? Because each one of us has the opportunity to shine light into dark places. Con incidentally, in this story, there, was, there were several ships that had gone past that point that night, and, and the captains reported to have seen the light, not knowing of the agonizing effort that these two young children were putting forth for their safety. Sometimes we, as we go about our daily lives, don't realize the ships that pass by us in the night. We don't realize the pain that some people are going through. And we don't realize the hopelessness of their situation if it weren't for people willing to sacrifice to share the light. Each one of us have an opportunity to be like that light. You know, what's interesting about a lighthouse is that when it shines, it's really only a mirror that's shining the light. The mirror doesn't have light of, it, of itself, but it's reflecting the light that's given it to reflect. I 
like, I, I like to go and visit nature. And one of my favorite places to go is into a cave. I, I remember when I was a kid, my parents took me to a national park out in um, Nevada called Great Basin National Park. And there is, in that national park, there's a set of caves called the Lehman Caves. And I remember being just a young child and... We went with the ranger. The ranger took us into the cave. And then all of a sudden, the ranger just switched the lights off. And, you know, as a kid, it's frequent that I have two young kids, and both of them, every night, tell me they're afraid of the dark. And I'm pretty sure that some of you guys who've had kids have had kids come to you say that they're afraid of the dark. And when you're in your room at night, there's always a little bit of light. Even if there's, you know, all the lights are turned off, there's always a little bit of light. But there's no darkness darker than the darkness of a cave. And I, I found that out when you try to put your hand as close to your face as you can and you can see absolutely nothing. With your eyes closed, eyes open, it doesn't matter. And sometimes your brain starts to play tricks on you thinking, are my eyes closed or open? You don't even know because it is so dark. We're going to talk about a few stories in this message as well, but I want you guys to realize that are, there are many people out there who have darkness deeper than the darkness of a cave. Hopelessness deeper than the hopelessness of a cave. Here in Texas, we have a population of 29.5 million people. 29.5 million people. We're actually the second largest state by population as well as by land mass. And these 29.5 million people, we, here in Texas Conference, we have 66,000 members. So each one, would have, each one of us would have to reach about 446 people for us to reach all 29 million. 446. Sounds like a lot. But amongst all of us, we could get it done. If we leave it up to pastors alone to reach these 29 million, it's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people each pastor is going to have to reach. It's impossible for us to finish this work, even in our small sphere of Texas, if just the pastors get involved and just the pastors work. We need everybody. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about a, the story of our... Um, of how literature ministry got started. Because I, I know that there are lots of different ways that we can minister to others, but one of the most effective ways for us to reach out to people is through literature ministry. And why is that? Why is it that literature ministries is so important? You know, in a day that everything seems digitalized and, and really books and, media, and um, printed work seems to be falling by the wayside, why is literature ministries still relevant? One of the things I get asked a lot is, well, you know, people could just look, it up, up, look us up on YouTube, you know, and watch a video. Or they could, you know, find us online. Why are we sharing printed work? Why is, it, why is this still a thing? You may not, when you reach somebody, when you talk to them, you may not have the opportunity to preach a whole sermon or go through a whole set of Bible studies with that person, but you can leave a book or a tract or a piece of literature that can, in your absence, the Holy Spirit can work directly with that person. And it's also a way that we can really reach this whole world. You know, there's not enough time for each one of us to give a full set of Bible studies to every single one of these 29 million people. But you can share a piece of literature that can lead them down the path that will help them to accept Jesus. Ellen White had a vision in 1848. She said that um, after a meeting that was held in Dorchester, um, she came out of vision and it said, after, she says, after I came out of vision, I said to my husband, I have a message for you. You must begin to print a little paper, send it out to the people and let it be small at first. But as the people read, they will send the means with which to print and it will be a success from the start. From this small beginning, it was shown me to be streams of light that went clear around the world. Streams of light. 
Um, but, you know, the Adventist church has always had a close tie to literature, but in this, we're not unique. In literature, through literature, we're not unique. We can trace back the importance of literature all the way back to Moses, really, with the five books of Moses being written. It was the first time the Word of God had been put into written form. And those books of Moses were disseminated throughout all of Judea and even beyond, where people had not every synagogue, but most synagogues had a portion, if not all, of the Torah. And then we can see that in the early Christian church, the writing down of the parables of Jesus, the, writing down, the writings of John, the writings of Mark, Luke, and Matthew allowed the story of the gospel to spread like wildfire. And then we can see the writings of Paul being disseminated to the churches to which he wrote, but then spread beyond to where each one of us have copies of these letters that Paul wrote in our Bibles. And if we continue to go down through history, we can see the Waldenses. You know, something that's interesting about the Waldenses is they were in a time when literature or when the Word of God was actually illegal for you to carry it, to read it, or definitely not to share it. And what the Waldenses would do is they would get the, open the seam of their robe and they would take just portions of Scripture, handwritten, painstakingly handwritten copies of Scripture. They would sew it inside their garments at the cost of their lives to share it with, maybe to find one person who's hungering for truth where they could cut open the seam and pull out just a portion of Scripture for them. The sacrifice that was made so that each one of us can have the Scriptures here today. We can also continue going down through. We can see the Reformation was started, which literature played a key role. Going back to who was called the morning star of the Reformation, John Wycliffe, he was instrumental in the translation of the first Bible into the English language. And then just a few years after that, something very important was invented. The printing press. The printing press has been well stated to be one of, if not the most important inventions of all time. From this point, it allowed for publications for the Bible and spe specifically, but all forms of knowledge to be published quickly without having to hand write every single bit of truth. And so because of this, the, in Martin Luther's day, he, you know the story where he nailed those 95 theses to the wall, to the, to the door of the church in Wittenberg. That idea of the Protestant Reformation was able to go viral in his day. And then he began with translating of the Bible into the German language. And from there, it really started what we know now as the Protestant Reformation. Um, Ellen White says here in Testimonies for the Church, he says, If there is one work more important than another, it is that of getting our publications before the public, thus leading them to search the Scriptures, missionary work, introducing our publications into families, conversing with them, praying with them, is a good work that will educate young men and young women to do pastoral labor. So, literature, spreading of literature, it, it, she says that, if there was one more, more important than another, that doesn't mean that literature ministries is the most important work that our church goes forward because we all, all of our ministries work together to help spread the gospel. But she says, if there was a work that was more important than another, it's that of getting our publications before the people. We have an opportunity coming up April 20 for us to spread the great controversy into our communities all around Texas. And it will, there's no way that I could pass out all these books by myself, or even my Cole Porters. Uh, this summer, we're looking at having about 42 Cole Porters that will be actually staying, we'll have a group staying in the Grand Prairie Church with Pastor Blue, and we'll have a group down in the valley. But these 42 students working full-time all summer are not going to have the same impact as all of us going out for one day. 
If all of us go out for one day, we will have more impact than my 42 students working full-time all summer. It's mind-boggling the results that we could see with total member involvement. And so going down through history again, um, she, these are some quotes. She talks about scatter them like the leaves of autumn. And um, we're going to go forward a little bit here. So going through history, our Adventist church was started through literature. Ellen White had that vision, and James White started a little paper called The Present Truth. And great sacrifices were made by our early pioneers to get literature into homes. Ellen and James White sacrificed time with their kids, time with their families. And I'm not recommending that we all do that. But what I'm saying is that they put everything on the line to get literature into homes. James White ended up walking for this first printing of the present truth. He ended up walking eight miles to Middletown, Connecticut to the post office to take, pack, to take uh, copies of the present truth to the post office to get mailed. And ended up walking eight miles back home. And from this were, were the first steps that would become a global publishing ministry. And now we can see publishing houses in every continent around the globe. And thousands of literature evangelists spreading truth all around the world. Um, our first literature evangelist here in the whole church actually had a very interesting story of how it began. He was, his name was George King, and he wanted to become a preacher. He wanted to be a pastor. And so he approached James White with a question say, hey, can I be a pastor? And James White didn't, didn't really think that he had what it took to be a pastor. And so he said, let's give it a trial. You can stay with a brother here from the church for one year, work on the farm, and we'll mentor you to being a pastor. And so, um, so Brother George King, he, he would sometimes preach to empty chairs in the living room, practicing his sermon. And one day it came opportunity for him to give his first sermon, but it was a horrible failure. And one of the ladies there in the group stood up and said, you're never going to be able to be a preacher. You'll never be able to hold the attention of a crowd. But you could be what they called a fireside preacher, somebody who goes in the homes, visits with people, shares the Bible. And so George... King took this as a calling from God and became the first literature evangelist. That he had a special book printed for him, and he would go into the homes of the people sharing books, studying the Bible with them, and he saw tremendous success. The, the reason for our church incorporating as a church actually came down to the Review and Herald Press needing to be registered under a company because James White was like tired of it being him being the owner of the Review and Herald, they needed to register under a church or a corporation, and so they incorporated the Seventh-day Adventist Church in order to register the press. And our first missionary, J.N. Andrews, was sent out to Switzerland because a piece of literature was found by some people there, and a group started to meet and study the truths of the Advent message and requested a missionary to be sent from North America to Europe, and J.N. Andrews was the first missionary to go as a result of the finding of a piece of literature. And so now we have several different ways that people can get involved in literature ministry. We have our full-time people, we still have full-time call porters that are going around doing this for their full-time job. Students from school, high school, college, any of you guys who are student age, high school or college, I recommend that you take the opportunity that you sign up for one of our student campaigns for the summer. I promise you it'll change your life. And then the, we have total member involvement or the general, the, the, the GC project, Great Controversy Project that we're working on in conjunction with the General Conference and also the North American Division. And so
each one of us have ways that we can get involved. You know, there, used to, there was an um, exhibit in the Chicago M Museum of Science and History, which was very interesting. And this exhibit was, was talking about the impact of one grain of wheat. And it showed a square, and in that square there was a grain of wheat, and then the next square there were two squares and two grains of wheat, and so on and so forth, the, the doubling aspect. So, and then there, there was a question that said, after 64 times, how much wheat do you think there would be? So if there's one kernel and then that went to two and then two went to four and four went to eight and eight went to 16 and so on and so forth, after 64 times, how, much, how many kernels of wheat would there be? And you could push a button and it would tell you the answer. And the answer was mind-boggling. It was enough wheat to cover the country of India 50 feet deep. The impact that we have as a church, if we look at the people passing by each day, the impact we could have if, if we change our mindset. I, I know that I'm as guilty of this as anybody. I see people passing by each day and I'm focused on, you know, my own things and what I'm doing. And since, instead of seeing souls passing by, I'm just like, okay, I got to go to the bank or I got to go to the supermarket or I got to go here. Instead of looking for people who I could reach. The gospel went very quickly in a very short amount of time in the very beginning. And Ellen White has, has told us that this whole movement is not going to end with less a manifestation of the power of God than with which it began. God is going to manifest himself in a powerful way in these last days, and he wants to use each one of us wants to use you, and he wants to use me. I want us to turn in our Bibles to our scripture reading. John chapter 4 and verse 35. In fact, I want to read verse 34 and onwards. It says, this is Jesus speaking, the woman at the well experience." You know, John 4, John, I love the book of John. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. And John writes a little differently than all the other Gospels. This is Jesus. He's come to the woman at the well. And Jesus had that mindset of looking for people. You can see, and the book of John brings it out specifically. You can see him just kind of happen upon the pool of Bethesda. Looking for the one. The one person who's hungering. And then he just happens to come along through Syrophoenicia. And this woman comes behind him and says, you know, heal my daughter, Lord, I pray you, heal my daughter of this demon. And you see here in John chapter 4, he just happens to stop by a well. You know, maybe if it had been me, I would have just sat there, I would have, you know, waited for somebody to get to come so I could get a drink of water, and then I would have you know, talked about, you know, meaningless stuff. Or maybe I would have just kept my mouth shut and been on my phone sitting there waiting for my friends to come back. But Jesus had an eye for people who were hungry. And so Jesus knew how to engage this woman in that conversation. And by the time the disciples get back, they ask him, have you had anything to eat? They bring food. But Jesus is so excited. He's so excited about seeing that woman leaving her pot there. You know, she came looking for water and she forgot her reason for coming and running down the hill. And I can just picture Jesus watching her run and seeing the souls that would be in the kingdom because of her testimony. And so the disciples come trying to convince him, hey, okay, we brought the food. Let's, let's, you know, let's have the picnic. Let's get the food out. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Verse 34 says, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the work of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say that there are four months yet until the harvest? Behold, lift up your eyes and look, for the harvest is white and ready. He who re reaps 
receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. Both he who sows and he who reaps rejoice together. Jesus was looking for souls. And what I like about this verse here is it points out that sometimes the person who sows the seed is not the one who reaps. And we, with, through literature ministry, have the opportunity to sow seeds. We may not see a harvest now, but we'll see it in eternity. And so how can, when we look at the work there is to be done, Sadly, our church um, worldwide is growing 2% per year. When factoring in, the area, some areas are growing more than that. Some areas are losing members. But as a whole, we're growing by approximately 2% per year. Population is growing by more than 2% per year. So we're not even, with our evangelistic efforts, not even keeping up with population growth. How are we going to finish this work when it seems like we're doing so much and accomplishing little? And I'm not meaning this to put down any of our evangelistic efforts because every single soul that we bring to Jesus is a soul that we'll see in the kingdom of heaven. Every single person who makes a decision for Jesus is important. And it's worth whatever we have to do to win each soul. But when we look at the dark areas of this world who are searching for truth, there's still completely unentered areas that have no presence of any Christianity. People who have never heard the name of Jesus. How can we do this? I want us to turn in our Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah is another one of those really encouraging stories to me. And I, share, I talk to my call porters about this all the time because Nehemiah shows up on the scene of Israel. And there's a big job that needs to be done. But this job has been waiting for years. You know, when Israel had come out of, out of Babylonian captivity, they had come back, they had rebuilt their temple, and then they had, after rebuilding their temple, they had gotten discouraged because the work was so big. And so rather than rebuilding the wall that surrounded their, their city, they had rebuilt their own houses and went on with their lives as though nothing was wrong. They went on with their lives, planting, harvesting for decades, for years, as though nothing was wrong. Nehemiah shows up on the scene, and he looks around. You guys know the story. He takes a time to go at night while nobody's watching to look for himself to see what was going on. And he sees the wall torn down, rubble everywhere. But Nehemiah shows up with a plan. And Nehemiah was a man of action. And so he came to Israel with enthusiasm and said, We can do this, guys. Let's rise up and build. And so what happened was, if you read through the whole book of Nehemiah, you'll see that they separated into Groups. Each family was given a little section of the wall to build. And I, and I can imagine that there was a little bit, maybe just a little bit of competition between the families. You know, if, if you see your family next to you building the wall faster than you, it's like, okay, we got to pick it up. We got to catch up. Nobody wanted to be the last family to finish their section of the wall. And so there was enthusiasm. Each family had a little portion of the work that was laid before them. I want to read here Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. And it says, The wall was finished in the 25th day of Elul. In 52 days, the wall was finished. And it happened when the enemies heard about it, all the nations around saw these things, and they were very disheartened in their eyes, for they perceived that the work had been done by God. What The work that had taken decades 
to even get started on was finished in 52 days because of two things, because of the power of God and because of the enthusiasm of the workers. Friends, we have an unprecedented unprecedented opportunity before us. There's a world to reach. Thousands of people all around us. Arlington. Thousands of people here in Arlington. Many of whom have never heard the name of Jesus. I want to um, read to you guys a quote here, and I don't have it in the PowerPoint, but I'm going to read it to you. This is from Manuscript Releases 347. And it says, why, says one, why, says one, how can we do all of this if the Lord is coming soon? Why the, why the Lord can do more in one hour than we can do in a lifetime. When he sees his people fully consecrated, let me tell you, a great work will be done in a short amount of time, and the message will, of truth will be carried into dark places of this earth where it has never been proclaimed. She says, a great work will be done in a short amount of time. And I believe that the story of Nehemiah is our story for this time. There's a huge work before us. But a great amount can be done in a short amount of time. The Lord can do more in one hour than we can do in a lifetime. I want to finish with um, telling a story. This happened, this was, um, you know, I, I work at the conference office helping to direct, recruit, and train Cole Porters to go out and share literature with people who are, who are searching. And but every once in a while, I'll take my family and just go out on my own because it's nice to get out of the office and just to get out in the field every once in a while. And so I took my wife and my son with me. My daughter hadn't been born yet. And we went to Fort Worth and decided to just go knocking on doors. And when, whenever, I don't know if any of you guys have ever knocked doors before, but if you knock doors, I promise you, you're going to have an experience. Sometimes it's a good experience. Sometimes it's not as good of an experience. But I promise you, you're going to have an experience. And if you do it long enough, you, I promise you, you will have what we call a divine appointment. And so my wife and I, I was carrying my son on one of those little backpacks that you, not backpacks, but packs you carry a baby on your front. So I was carrying him. I had books in my hand. And we're going just door by door. And we get to this one door, and there's a gate the gate's slightly open, and it says, beware of dog. My wife looks at me, and she says, we got the baby. And I, look, I look at her, and I'm like, well, like the gate's already open. If there was a dog in there, the dog would be out here. Let's just go knock. You know, what's the, we'll be okay. And so we passed through the gate. It was already open, and it was a duplex. I knock on, we knock on the first door, and it's always a little awkward when there's a duplex because you know the person in the house next to you can hear your whole presentation, but we knock on the first one, guy comes out, he's like, nah, I'm not interested, and so we just step over five feet and knock on the next door, and a lady that opens the door, and I see on the back wall just a ton of crosses, like, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 crosses on the back right behind the door. And I'm like, man, praise the Lord. This lady's a Christian. Um, she's probably going to be nice. And um, so I start off with a devotional book um, called Peace Above the Storm, or many of you guys may know it by Steps to Christ. And so I show her that book, and I start talking about it. And she says, you know, we have a, just stop right where you are. I'm not a Christian anymore. And so my mind is like, okay, Christian anymore. So I said, if I may ask, ma'am, like, you said you're not a Christian anymore. What, what changed? Like, why aren't you a Christian anymore? And she says, well, last year my mom got sick and she died, and my dog also got sick and he died within a few months of each other. And I prayed that God would heal them, and neither one were healed. Both of them died, and I just decided after that that, you know, if God must not even be real. 
And so I talked with her, and I talked about how, you know, the things that we see bad happening in our lives are not because of God, but rather it's because we live in a world of sin. And death was never a plan. Death was never God's plan. And, but rather, this is because sin entered into this world is why we experience death. But we have a hope. We have a hope that one day Jesus will come again and there won't be any more death. And so I talked to her about this and um, I, I asked her if it was okay if I prayed with her. Before the prayer, I pulled out a smaller version of Steps to Christ, handed it to her, and said, you know, I'll leave this with you if you promise you me you're going to read it. She says, I'll read it. I said, it's been a big blessing to my life. Not trying to, you know, force you or anything, but I just want to share something with you that's been a huge blessing to me. She promised me she'll read it. And at the end of the, that, I pray with her. And at the end of the prayer, I, she, just, she just looks up and tears are just streaming down her face. And she looks at me and she says, I think he sent you to me today. And I remember looking at my wife and th thinking like, man, what if we hadn't gone through the gate? The woman went in just a short conversation from not believing in God anymore to saying that God sent me to her today. And I was struck with the realization that she is not the only person in town that's feeling this way. She's not the only person in town that has gone through a loss who may be questioning whether God is even real. There are thousands of them, and we pass by them every single day. But it's going to take us to have that mind of Jesus that stops, you know, every second, free second that we have, we just go to our phone. And I'm, I'm a millennial, I'm as guilty of it as anyone. But Rather than looking down at our phones, look up. Look into the eyes of the people around you and see those people who are hurting, those people who are suffering, those people who could hear a kind word, those people who need to know that Jesus loves them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, the par harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Lord, the work before us is huge with billions of people worldwide and millions of them have never heard the name of Jesus. There are people right here in town that don't know you're, that you are a God of love, who don't know the love of Jesus. Lord, help us to see them. Help us to stop focusing on just building up our own lives and work to build up your kingdom. Forgive us for our sins, clean our hearts, and we're asking for a special outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us today. And especially as we go out on April 20 to pass out the great controversy, we ask that your angels would go before us, that you would prepare the way, and that you would give us your spirit. We thank you because you've promised this. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. For our closing hymn, please join me and stand as we sing hymn number 183, I Will Sing of Jesus' Love.
Let's remain standing for prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, you see each one of us standing here. You know the desires of our heart. We ask that you would give us the strength and the power to go forth from here to share your love with those around us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.